we have a panel of speakers, so I'd call up our panel of speakers, and we have Kerry Acevedo, who's the Executive Director for Habitat for Humanity. We have John Groh, the President and CEO of the Rockford Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. We have Matthew Worley, Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging for the Rockford Park District. And we have Eric Cunningham, the Vice President, Electric Power Systems from Collins Aerospace. So first, I uh, would say a huge thank you to each of our panelists for being with us today. I'm gonna ask them a, a couple of questions. The first one kind of setting the stage of where they're at as an organization, but would also, as we move throughout this process, engage you as the audience to ask them questions as well. The first question is, could you just briefly share a summary of the work that you've been undertaking over the last two years? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Carrie Acevedo, I'm the Executive Director at Rockford Area Habitat for Humanity and a proud member of the Belonging Task Force, part of the co-creating systems and structures work group. So thank you all for being here. This is a kind of a dream come true for our group. So thanks for being a part of this. When Pam first asked me to sit on this panel, I was like, well, I don't belong up here. First of all, I'm not wearing a suit. Um, <laughs> because we are not, right, as a small nonprofit organization, I don't know that I would have necessarily referred to us as a model employer. I am excited about what Rockford Area Habitat for Humanity has been able to accomplish over the last couple of years, but by no means are we experts. I know the mayor spoke about that this morning when he talked about the city of Rockford. For my friends at Collins, uh, we're really an airplane that we are building and flying at the exact same time. So we are attempting to both break down some barriers and things that we have had in place organizationally while at the exact same time trying to build new systems and new processes and opportunities for people to belong. Rockford Area Habitat for Humanity is an organization that focuses on ensuring that everyone has a safe, affordable, healthy place to lay their head at night. That is our goal is to ensure that every single person in our community has a place to call home, where they feel the safest. As I'm sure you can recognize, many of the people that we've had the privilege of serving over the years have been othered their whole life. They are the victims of redlining, they are the victims of not being able to have access to credit. And so organizationally, we made a decision to take a stand we made a decision to say, we are going to evolve. We are going to be the best organization we can be for the families we have the privilege of walking alongside. And so our organization created a DEI committee. Diversity, equity, and inclusion became a conversation at staff meetings. It became a conversation at board meetings. And just last night, our DEI committee met. It becomes sometimes intense conversations about what it is we need to do to be more of a belonging organization. We started with the top. We started thinking about how do we find board members that represent our community? How do we ensure that the voice of low-income families are there? How do we ensure that the voice of people of color are there who have been systematically excluded from housing in our society and certainly in our community. And so we started to recruit diverse board members and people who we felt would have a voice at the table. We started to do trainings for our staff and our board, our key volunteers. We brought in consultants with the help of DHS's Healing Illinois grant. We were able to bring in consultants to our organization to teach some of our, as um, Professor Powell calls them, older white men, about microaggressions and some of those things that, you know, they might not necessarily know about yet. And so we were able to go through this training program for both our staff and our volunteers and our board members, and it became a conversation. People started to call things out. At staff meetings or at board meetings or in committee meetings, we would hear someone say something and we would say, hold on, does that create the atmosphere that we want in our organization? And so we just became, began holding each other accountable. And then the hard work began. We started looking at our own systems. 
our own structures, our own policies, and we started rewriting them. We instituted a code of conduct that every single person who steps onto a Rockford Area Habitat for Humanity work site or a restore or in a committee had to sign. And they had to agree that they were going to ensure that everyone that they came in contact with had a sense of belonging and felt included in our organization. We started talking about the actual process in which we choose families that get to participate in Rockford Area Habitat for Humanities program. And we started just dismantling some of the ugliness that we had as an organization been doing for 30 plus years. We used to use the words sweat equity. We used to require that families have to come out on our time frame to do their hours of sweat equity. There's nothing equitable about sweat equity. At a very base level, we changed it to the word partnership. And immediately you could see the sense in our homeowners and our home buying applicants just take that kind of sigh of relief. They didn't necessarily know what sweat equity meant. They just knew that they owed me something, and they don't. In fact, I owe them. So we really started, oh, thanks. <laughs> so we really started kind of looking at this idea of what partnership really means. Historically, that meant that you have to come out on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays, and you would have to pick up your hammer and put on your cute hard hat, and you would have to actually build your house. And what we recognized is that in order to work full time, some of our families were working three jobs, in order to support their family, that did not fit their schedule. So we started giving people credit for secondary education. We started giving people partnership hours for being involved in civic organizations and volunteering at their church. We started looking at ways true partnership worked in their life. We started providing them extra opportunities to learn more about financial independence and financial stability. And sure enough, everyone started taking those classes. And we would get calls from our applicants and our home buyers, and they would say, you know, my credit score went up four points this month. People started tracking what that meant on their phones, and they were celebrating that with us. Sweat equity meant that they owed us. Partnership meant that we were walking alongside them in this process. We are far from model, but what we recognize as an organization is that we have done some things wrong in the past, and that when you know more, you do more. And organizationally, we want to be better. We want to serve our families better. We want to be a model in this space of belonging, and I am humbled to get to share our small part of that story. Thank you. Well, Carrie, th thank you. I, I mean, you just think about the lives that you're really impacting and you're walking alongside. What beautiful comments. Thank you for that. Next, I'll turn it over to John Grill. Good thank luck you, topping that one, I John. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Bring it hard and with passion this morning. Good job, Carrie. I echo exactly what you said at the start. When Pam called and asked if I'd be up here, I said, I don't know that I should be up here. I don't know that we as an organization should be up here as a model employer. And had a very similar conversation with Pam about the journey and where we are as an organization, where we get to be in the community, where we are as employers and as employees at the Rockford Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. I'll talk about the past two years, which is the question the mayor posed, but I'll go back a few steps to say, 13 or so years ago when I started in my current position, came into the organization at a time when there had been uh, some disconnects with our community. And a colleague, well, it, kind of hard to call him a colleague, he was more of a mentor and a hero, Webbs Norman uh, stepped in and he and I had conversations about um, the importance of connectivity to our community, linkages to our residents, and uh, through conversations, invited me into uh, a space that he created for me and the organization using his resources and his connections to create some feedback groups, some listening groups, and uh, with, with leaders and with citizens within our minority communities. And I remember thinking in those early days about my job that I knew my role, our role, was to bring more economic opportunity to our community by bringing more visitors to our community. And I did understand then, and I do understand 
understand now that part of that is making sure that we're inviting all people to our community. You know, the combined economic value of the uh, African American and Hispanic travel market is $160 billion in our country. So I understand from an economic sense, we want to be open and welcoming to all. But I don't know that then and even now sometimes we, we get it right or we do it right. In one of those conversations that Reverend Ken Board, uh, who retired from Pilgrim, told me, John, remember that green is green. All money spends the same. Through our marketing and through our positioning, through our, the invitations of the sales efforts that we do, we're, we're inviting all people to our community. But I don't know that that was ever enough. I don't know that we ever got it fully correct. I think that we were trying to be inclusive in the work that we were doing at the Visitors Bureau. But as Professor Powell was talking about, were we creating a sense of belonging? Were we saying uh, that all are truly welcome here, uh, invited to be here, have their own place here? Or were we just kind of taking the first couple of steps? And I, and I think we were more than anything taking the first couple of steps, not all of the steps. So over the past several years, we've been, as an organization, talking about what's good for a resident is good for a visitor. And that's really different in our world. A lot of bureaus across the country, even around the world, think through the lens of what's good for a visitor is good for a resident. As we had that mind shift of what was good for a resident is good for a visitor, we began thinking through the realities of needing to make sure that our residents had a sense of belonging so that our visitors would have a sense of belonging. And going back, uh, you know, more than two years ago now in the summer of 2020, obviously to Damon's point, you know, the sense of urgency was great in our world uh, here locally and across our country with the killing of George Floyd and, and others. And it was in those moments when we had to make decisions, when we had to determine if we would act, if we would do things differently, if we would process differently, if we would commit to new actions. And so led by our board at the top, uh, by our staff, including Marticia Brown, who was on our staff at the time, really committed to listening first and spent what seemed like an eternity at the, at the time, I, I kept thinking we need to go faster. As I look back, it was a couple of months. The intentional groups where we were listening, where we were asking questions about our organization, about our practices, about our reputation, how we could do more, how we could be better with members of our diverse community, speaking things that were hard to listen to, hard to hear sometimes, thinking that we had done enough and learning that we hadn't, helped us understand that in order to be a better community, be a better organization, we had to do some things differently. So really what that process led to through you know, listening and then planning, thinking through what our commitments would be, we took to our board in September of 2020 nine commitment statements that were then enshrined in 11 different board policies. So the third pillar of our four-part pillar was to commit ourselves to action. And so now um, on a regular basis, 11 different policies that I have to report on throughout a calendar year as the executive of our organization, we're demonstrating to our board our achievement or our non-achievement in these areas. And then you know we get to that point of being able to achieve those commitments uh, through the work that we put in as a staff. And so just a couple of those commitments, um, I won't read them all. I was, I was looking at my list and it's like, I want to talk about that one and I want to talk about that one. They're all so important. But the first one, and I think we kept it there at the top, was that we were committed to continuous engagement with our diverse community. That we wouldn't start a feedback group 13 years ago and end it. That we would have ongoing dialogue. That we would have deep relationships, that we would have friendships and partnerships that allowed for continuous feedback. And from there, I think, flows our ability to execute on the others, ensuring that our staff and our board and our volunteers reflect our community, ensuring that our spend, our economic spend, is distributed you know, in, in equitable ways, that we're marketing to minority communities in ways that reach them, uh, that resonate with them, and with media that um, is owned by diverse business groups or business interests, uh, making sure that uh, as we develop events like Stroll on State, we're doing so in ways that are inclusive and that everybody feels that they belong. Through these nine commitments, I think that we're doing better work, as has been said here, and obviously historically, when you know better, you do better. 
Um, I think there are things that I personally just see now that I didn't see before, and we were willing to listen and have some feedback that maybe we hadn't been willing to or open to listening and hearing before. Circling all the way back to those 13 years ago when Webs helped me have some conversations in, in communities that I wasn't connected to, one thing that I wish I would have done differently is I wish I would have kept those conversations going. I think the work would have been fuller, more robust, more authentic throughout these last 13 years of my own journey in, in this position. Even two years ago would have been in a much different place to, to act on behalf of the community uh, through our work in, in creating a sense of belonging and welcoming through the, the work of inviting people to our community. Here. You brought up Webbs Norman. We're in a park district facility. We appreciate that uh, the director, Jay Sandine, is with us uh, here today. So we'll turn to Matthew Worley. My name is Matthew Worley, and I am the director of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. I will say that I am the first director of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and I think that is a feat in itself, and I'm very proud to be in this role. To start off, I want to tell you a little bit of a story, because who doesn't like a good story? So 113 years ago, a Swedish immigrant came to the Rockford area, and he believed that families needed a public park space to enjoy life, to get away from some of, the, some of the stresses of work. He imagined a safe space for children to safely run and play. This man's name was Levin Faust, and he started our Rockford Park District. And he also created our mission of helping people enjoy life. This mission is still tried and true to this day, because over a century later, the need for recreation and park space are still apparent. In 2022, we still live in uncertainty from a global pandemic, continued racial and, and civil unrest, political division, and also, I will say, a national mental health crisis. Park and recreation is more than a luxury, but a necessity to break the tides of uncertain time. The Rockford Park District historically recognizes its length and also recognizes its history and how history can reinforce, it can provide us with a way to look back, but we also have to understand that our history has helped and hurt us in that time as well. In that work though, starting back way back when with Webbs Norman, we started this work by really realizing that we needed to have a park district that represented the people in which we serve. And I think that is a beautiful thing. Moving forward, you know, the Rockford Park District has been on this DNI journey well before I arrived. You know, prior to my arrival, we had established an equity committee that still is in existence. We removed many barriers from entry for applications, and we've made equity adjustments in compensation and also have a diversity and inclusion policy, which I think we should all be very proud of. During my short time here, we have made many strides to formalize our DEIB work. And also, we added it to have the word belonging in our DNI initiative, because belonging is something we all can want, we can all desire, we can all want to, to focus on for the future. We've really focused our efforts on three key areas of workforce, our suppliers, and recreational programming. I mean, I'll talk a little bit about those, and I'll talk about some other areas too. But really, identifying how can we not only increase diversity for our workforce, but how can we create a space for our workforce to really thrive? How can they bring their best selves? How can they not just come into work, check in, do their job and leave, but how can we create an environment where people really want to be here, right? How can they give that discretionary effort, that little bit of extra effort whenever times are tough and when things really need to get done? So again, not just bringing diversity into the workplace, but also ensuring that diverse employees and all employees feel that they can give that extra effort. For suppliers, we're actively focused on ensuring that our suppliers are just as diverse as the community. Of course, it's not always easy, but we're continuing to focus that and we're going to be hosting an expo, a little plug just so you know, <laughs> we're gonna be hosting an expo on November 2nd to help us understand how can we diversify our vendors and cut some of that red tape. And then recreational programming. We have such a diverse community here and creating an opportunity for everyone, regardless of whether they've just been to a park district facility one time, they've only been to a playground, or they've interacted for years. Everyone has the same opportunity to come to our park district and play with us. There are two other areas that I've, I'm still thinking that we need to focus on, which is leadership, because at the park district, anyone can jump in as a leader. We can expect someone at the front desk to have to put out a fire, have to use an AED, we're all leaders and we're really grounding ourselves on what is called inclusive leadership. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. 
but leadership is extremely important. And if, as we're all expecting people to be leaders, then you better expect we're going to expect everyone to be inclusive leaders in that. And then finally, partnerships. I think partnerships is an area that we need to continue to focus on and ensuring that our partners align with our values and making sure that if we are practicing what we preach, they are practicing what they preach as well. Additionally, we've also embarked on some formal training when it comes to DNI, which I will talk again about, but we went down the route of doing some personality assessments, some debriefs, some tailored diversity and inclusion training, and we've embedded that into our leadership development programming. And then finally, we have made a very intentional effort to build community partnerships with and connect with those communities that maybe haven't always interacted with the Park District. Maybe they've been a little bit timid, or maybe they just never felt the opportunity to be a part of us. And we really do want to create that space where everyone can really have access to quality park and recreation. Our efforts at the Rockford Park District are intentional, and we are committed to ensuring that all are truly welcomed at our facilities, and they can really take part in our wonderful park system. So thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew, and congratulations on being the first to hold your position. Uh, and a huge congratulations and thank you to the Park District for creating that position. It means a lot. Next, we're going to turn to Eric Cunningham from Collins Aerospace. I, I just want to add, appreciate as a corporate citizen just the emphasis that you personally, as well as the entire organization, has brought to a community and a sense of belonging, not just for your employees, but for all of us as well. Thank you. They always say to never follow a great speaker. I don't know what I did to get the fourth position after three of them, but I'll do my best, so bear with me. No, thank you everyone for making time and being here this morning. This is a great event and I'm honored to be here. I have 47 slides with increasing detail that I'm gonna read word for word on the history of our company, so bear with me, no. The reality is I grew up 13 miles from here and until I got a job at Sunstrand back in 1999, I had no idea what they did. So, just very briefly, I thought I'd just give you an idea. Collins Aerospace is now the largest system supplier in the world when it comes to aerospace and defense. And so, when this got brought together, a lot of people think of Collins as a portfolio business. It's just a group of different businesses that have been glued together to uh, support a P&L somewhere. The reality is it was very intentional on how it was put together with the idea that one plus one was gonna equal three with the solutions that we could provide the aerospace industry as we move forward. And so as an example, we are key to supporting the mission that the aerospace industry will have net zero carbon emissions by the year 2050. No, we do not know how we're gonna do it yet. But, and you think about this from a Raytheon Technologies perspective, we make the engines, we wrap nacelles around the engines, we make the motors that are gonna support hybrid electric propulsion, just like your Toyota Prius, and we're gonna be the ones that make this possible. And so, we have several other lofty goals like this, but guess what? Our progress is going to be paced by the quality of the talent that we can come in to support and lead the organization, which is why this is such an important topic to us. We have a DE&I mission statement, and if you look at that mission statement, it has words like approaches, idea, culture, innovation, passion, new paths, limitless possibilities. There's no words like gender, race, ethnicity, anything like that. And so what it's about is what we can accomplish when we work in an environment where people feel supported and feel safe and feel like they belong. The reality is that nobody can bring their best self to work if they don't feel those things. And that's what we're all about and that's what we need in order to achieve those goals that I spoke about earlier. And so it's not enough to do this within our four walls. The reality is that if we're going to be a good corporate citizen, as the mayor just mentioned, we need to figure out how to take that forward and bring this to the rest of our community. So real change in society happens when businesses adopt these beliefs and push them forward out into their communities. And so that's what inspired us to create a community engagement council several years ago and be very much more deliberate about how we engage. And so the focus is really around redefining futures. And you can see some of the areas that we focus on in our corporate giving, in our volunteering, in our partnerships with different organizations like the ones you see here today. And I'd add that the references here on this slide show what we do here in Rockford, but we're a global business. And there's one of these slides that could be created for all of our sites, whether that's York, Nebraska, Solihull, England, Nordling in Germany, or any of our other sites around the world as well. So this isn't a principle we just adopt here in Rockford for our 2,000 employees. 
it's a principle we adopt at Collins and we ask that people adopt that within the communities wherever they may work, live, and play. How do we do this and what are some examples of what this means? So being visibly inclusive in the community. So for the past two years, the mayor has joined us in raising the pride flag in front of the building at Collins. And I can say back in 2018, when pride got resurrected at Collins, people were afraid to even say they were part of that group. It was a big moment of pride three or four years later when we actually went out and raised the flag in front of the building so the whole community could see that. That was a lot of progress for us. And then helping to sponsor the Point 1K Pride Celebration with B103 earlier this summer. The creative murals that we do with the Rockford Area Convention Visitors Bureau, those were all focused on messages of diversity and inclusion within the community. We wanted to make sure that we were sending a message, not just putting art on the wall. But also being visible contributors in the community. So the Colin Cares has done a significant partnership with the Rockford Park District and being able to go out, clean up parks, and be part of the community in that way. Keeping people safe and informed, a big emphasis on informed throughout the last two and a half years. We are the first site within all of Raytheon Technologies to do an on-site vaccination clinic. We had very deliberate engagement. Every day, two executives walked the entire building, both at 11th Street as well as on Alpine, just to make sure we were visible and we had an opportunity for people to hear and give us feedback on what was going on. And listening to those that may not have agreed with all the policies we were putting in place. I really hope we're coming to an end because I can't handle one more debate on masks or vaccines, I can tell you that. But we've also started our own Uncomfortable conversation series as well. The very first one was led by our president, Henry Brooks, who actually started his career here in Rockford many years ago. And he is the only black president within Collins. There are six presidents. And he gave us insight that a lot of us wouldn't have thought about what it's been like for him to progress in his career as a black man, where, to the point made earlier, most of us statistically within the organization are white men. And so it gave us a great perspective. And what it's really about is understanding the perspective of other people so we can be better educate, connect with them better, and see how we can help them all feel like they belong with an organization. And when you think about that, the latest series we just let out last week was actually around our production and maintenance workers. And so that's not a group you'd normally think about. We need to focus on belonging but they have been very vocal about the fact for the last two and a half years, they didn't have the ability to take their monitor home and sit at their kitchen table and do their work. They had to come to work every single day, turn a wrench, build a part, put it out the door. And they didn't feel like they were being heard as somebody who had a need to belong because they suddenly felt excluded from some of the benefits that the rest of the organization was getting. So it really means opening the aperture up and thinking about who may be feeling excluded who needs to be heard and understood, and how do we help them all feel like they're part of the organization? Thank you, Eric. As you all told us that you embarked on this new journey, what would you do differently if you could start that journey over today? So I have a long list of failures, I'll go first. But if I could go back, let's just say two and a half years, I would spend more time acknowledging and meeting the organization where it was. Dr. Powell talked an awful lot about focusing on bridging and not dividing. And while all of our, our intentions were extremely positive, when it came to topics like diverse representation and social justice, what we didn't realize was that whilst we were giving those messages, we were actually creating a divide because there was a large portion of the population that didn't understand why we were talking about those things. And I know those may seem obvious to a lot of us here, but the reality was a lot of them were asking, look, I just wanna to come to work and do my job. I'm not sure why we have to talk about these particular topics. Why are we talking about George Floyd in a town hall? Where are we at in our business? When are we gonna hit our quality ratings? How are we doing financially? The light bulb that came on for a lot of us was we never stopped to really provide better context around the why. And so the Uncomfortable Conversation series, which we can't take credit for, someone way more popular and better looking than me, put that out a few years ago and we shamelessly stole that. But what he had started was providing perspective of this is what it's like to be one of these groups. 
and it really was intended to help other people understand what that felt like. So if I could do anything different, I would go back and help explain the why behind the what so that those people didn't feel like we were trying to push something at them that wasn't going to matter to everyone as we went through our journey. I would have started earlier. I started with Rockford Habitat in July of 2014, and I remember feeling a disconnect almost immediately between some of our volunteers and some of our home buyers going through the program, retired, financially stable, corporate men, right? Engineering degrees, carpenters coming out and working on our build sites and our families having this kind of interesting interaction with them. I wish I would have known then what I know now, because I think that the 50 some people who have purchased a house from Habitat in the last eight years under my leadership would have had a different experience. When we did take on this initiative as a board of directors and as a staff, I would have solicited more opinions. I would have solicited more advice from our families, from our stakeholders, from our donors, from community members who are involved in our organization. We looked internally and made the list of all the things we thought we were doing wrong, but we never vetted that list against those we were doing wrong to. And so I feel like we would have engaged in more conversation. We would have brought more people to the table and said, let's have this uncomfortable conversation. Let's get comfortable being uncomfortable for a little while so that in the future we can all belong here in this space equally. I would have started a long time ago and I would have asked the people that mattered what their thoughts and opinions were. I love where we're going, especially with the uncomfortable conversations. I, I, I watched uh, Emmanuel Acho on YouTube in 2020, and he talked about uncomfortable conversations, the experiences he had. And I, and I wish that you know, we would have done something like that internally. At the Park District, they, they had had these conversations way prior to me arriving with the Equity Committee. And I mean, some of these conversations were very uncomfortable. If I could do something over, and I don't know if it's do over, but I would have done something in addition. I think that we had really great conversations coming in, but I would have started really looking at some data. I, I would have wanted to understand where are we now? If we just looked at a snapshot in time, where are we? So you know, we, we recently just finished our DEIB survey that measures multiple different factors in our organization. And I personally would have loved to have done that sooner. I think we would have really understood kind of where people's are, what their sentiments are, and then we could have compared that with some of the qualitative information where we would be getting from our equity committee because th there's really great information, insights that I, that I could have gleaned. And then now looking at some of the data now, I, th I think it really just checks some of my assumptions. It helps me understand where we are and really where we have moved, moved the needle, where we need to continue doing the work. So I think collecting data is extremely important for organizations. Um, I know the mayor mentioned something earlier. Data really helps drive decisions. If you're making decisions without a lot of data, I would recommend start doing it. It's really helpful, especially when it comes to looking at demographic data, when it comes to, to looking at recreational data, for, especially for us. We need to really understand what's the data telling us and how can we move forward and move forward with a smarter decision based on that data. I'm supposed to be asking you what other roadblocks you've overcome, so I will ask you that. But I want to throw a little wrinkle in there because I think when people begin this work, it can be a bit daunting. Can you also say something that was easier than you anticipated? So yes, a roadblock, but maybe something that you may have feared, but it actually worked out really well, or that you may have spent a lot of time stressing about, but it was much smoother than you anticipated as well. What went smoother than I expected? People's genuine willingness, when asked questions, to give honest and constructive feedback in a way that wasn't harmful or without malice or bad intent. When we asked questions of how could we do better or what have we been doing well, people came to the table with generosity in their feedback and in what they wanted to see for us. And I really appreciated that. Those individuals who, who were part of those early conversations uh, a couple years ago uh, continue to be great members of my own feedback loop or our feedback loop. And that uh, surprised me in, in, in really positive ways. Some roadblocks. There are people who don't want an organization like us that welcomes the world to our community or puts out the welcome mat to be in this space. There are people who don't want the Visitors Bureau to say things like, all people are welcome here. 
a couple of years ago, back in the summer of 2018, when we worked with the city on redoing those panels out by I-90. And we put a, a message that essentially says, all people are welcome. There were people who called me and said, John, not all people are welcome here. Do you mean you want this person here or these people here? And that created some interesting, good conversations. Some people will spend money. And the mayor says anyone who will spend money. But I guess that gave me an opportunity, because those phone calls came to me, an opportunity to, to talk through why, yes, I mean these people, why it really does mean all people. Uh, that was at a, at a time in 2018 when there was a lot of conversation about immigration. It gave us an opportunity to talk about, or for me to reflect on how Rockford is a community of immigrants and how people for hundreds of years since being settled by European settlers anyways, people have been coming here and making a difference and building lives and how we want those visitors who come here who might in the future be residents to know that they're welcome here. So if we faced a roadblock, um, that's one of them. In my better moments, when I've had you know the, the strength to have those conversations back, hopefully have reflected that truly all people are welcome here and to, to do so in a way that isn't afraid of people who, who might not want us in this space. I don't know if any of you have noticed, but Rockford natives are the biggest critics of Rockford. Don't think that's any big surprise. That being said, uh, if I think about things that went easy, I'd like to give a compliment to two people up here. The first is the mayor. Two years ago, as I mentioned, the first time we raised the pride flag out in front of the building, we were a little bit anxious about that. How's this gonna go over? You know, we're gonna put something out front. I texted the mayor, as I usually end up doing around 6.30 in the morning, he's an early guy, and I just said, hey, is this something that you would consider? And it was a really long text and all this stuff, and I just got like two words back, or three. That would be awesome. He didn't ask when it was, he didn't ask anything else, he just said he'd do it. And so, another example is the murals we mentioned earlier the Rockford Area Convention Visitors Bureau. I can go to John and say, I'd like to do something around STEM-oriented careers for underprivileged children. And he pairs us up with an artist, they come up with a concept, and now we have murals that send this message. And so, as hard as we are on ourselves as members of this part of the world, I guess I would just say I am very much encouraged by a lot of leadership we have and their willingness to take this on and really create an environment and a community where we'd really do all belong. So once in a while, we should give ourselves a little bit of credit because we are doing a lot of great things. I would say one of the biggest roadblocks as an organization we faced was the idea that this is the way we've always done it. Especially in the nonprofit universe, right? If it's not broke, don't fix it, comes up at a lot of tables and in a lot of conversations. And so organizationally, we have done incredible work in our community. For 30 plus years, we've been providing safe, healthy, affordable housing to families who are hardworking and who deserve it. And so it's hard to look introspectively at a successful organization and say, Maybe we do have some things to fix. And so one of our biggest roadblocks was just this idea of we've been doing great. Why are we criticizing ourselves and why are we picking apart what we're doing and what we say and how policies are written? And so that was definitely kind of a, a shift in, in the way we thought about things. One of the things that made it easy for us was that almost immediately upon saying we're going to start this initiative and we're going to you know, put this committee together, a lot of people raise their hands. Staff members, board members, community members, stakeholders, committee members, uh, a handful of people immediately raised their hand without knowing what that was gonna look like. They were happy to help in the initiative and so we are gathering more people as we continue to do the work and bringing more people into the fold and so, I didn't necessarily know that that was going to be so easy in the beginning, and it has turned out to be one of our biggest assets is just the sheer number of people who are committed to this initiative and ensuring that we are an organization of belonging. I just wanted to say that I echo everything here, and I think internally we have similar roadblocks, similar successes. I just want to just double down on what, what Eric said, that we do have a really great community, and we are a little bit hard on ourselves in our community. I mean, yes, there are struggles, there are, there are strife, but we're all doing the work. If you look at all of these organizations that paid for a ticket to come here, 
we have to recognize the fact that we're trying to be a better community and to build a place of belonging. So I just wanted to recognize that. Great point. How are you engaging talent acquisition as well as staff development of your own organizations through that lens of belonging? Talent development, if anyone knows me, this is my, my favorite part of work. I think diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging um, initiatives have to be tied to the talent management life cycle. I mean, especially when it comes to talent development and talent acquisition. The Park District, we have a wonderful HR department. We're led by Rashonda Williams, who's in the back over there. We do amazing work when it comes to HR. We've grown our department almost double, I would say, Rashonda. And from a talent acquisition standpoint, we started removing these barriers a long time ago, right? We don't require our resume to apply. We offer assistance to people whenever they want to come in and they want to apply for positions. So we are really, really moving the needle. We even hired a recruiter where we go to the people, right? We don't expect them to come to us or come to a recruiting event all the time at our location. We'll go to the community. We were, we were just at a location a few weeks ago, right? And I was helping people fill out an application, answering questions. It's really just being there for people whenever they need you, right? We still have a lot of work to do, but we're still meeting people where they're at. From a development standpoint, we have embedded DNI in our leadership development program. And I'm very proud to say that leadership development is something that we've done at the Park District, but we have a formalized program with the help of Jordan McDonald, who was our talent development specialist. We've created this multi-year, competency-based, multi-level leadership development journey. And this is huge, really. This is something that Collins Aerospace would have or you know, a large entity, but it's not something that I think we've truly kind of grasped here and it's really wonderful. This year we focused on the inclusion competency and we've really helped our staff build self-awareness around what does it mean for you to be on this journey, right? And that's taking a step back, of course. We've taken a step back from having these super uncomfortable conversations to help us realize what is your role in moving the needle forward? Because we all need to know, if we don't understand ourselves, that we certainly can't help other people. So I've been really, really excited to, that we've spent eight months really working with team members across the district to build intercultural competence, self-awareness, collective awareness, have critical conversations, understanding how to communicate with conflict, intercultural conflict styles, inclusive behaviors, and actually right now as we speak, we have a training going on for psychological safety. So really intentional effort, grounding ourselves in research-based trainings, and of course the results will reveal themselves next year, but I can say anecdotally, our staff are competent in explaining who they are, which is very important. Knowing your own story and being able to explain your story and where you come from is powerful. They're able to articulate what makes them unique, and they're able to understand and they're able to differentiate between inclusive and non-inclusive behaviors. And that's empowering to people. Here I go following something like that again. But if I don't answer this, my HR business partner will hang me from the rafters. So I will do my best. As we go through all the work that we've done, the very first thing is the candidate experience when you look at talent acquisition. How do we come across to them as we're starting to present ourselves? And one of the first things they're going to do is go through an interview. So one of the things we've committed to are diverse interview panels, making sure that when people come in the door, they don't walk away from that interview going, wow, I spent all day talking to people and nobody looked like me. Because that's gonna be a big turnoff for them and that's gonna send that first message as to whether they will potentially belong with our organization when they come to us. And so we wanna make sure they have an experience where they feel fairly treated and they feel like they can be confident we're gonna help them achieve their career goals. We are very proud of our employee resource groups and how powerful they've been. Damon was uh, one of the brave individuals who came up and asked a question earlier. I think he's been a member of half our employee resource groups over the years at different times and led them. And so that's a, a powerful message to candidates as they come in as well. But it also provides good perspective to the executive sponsors from a leadership development perspective also because it helps them to learn things about how they can better relate to the organization. We've invested in a partnership with Northern Illinois College of Engineering with a specific focus on building relationships and connectedness with underrepresented groups. Again, being focused in our recruiting to make sure that we are recruiting in a way that's going to help us improve our representation. And then another thing we've started a couple years ago was reverse mentoring. 
And so if you've never heard of this, it means somebody like me at a level somewhere in management, suddenly I have a reverse mentor that may be a young lady who's only been with the company for two years. And she's now mentoring me about how I interface with the organization. And I can tell you that you talk about an uncomfortable conversation. That can get very eye-opening. And the, the dialogue has been two ways with that. It's been eye-opening not just for people like myself getting that mentoring, but it's also been eye-opening for, I would say, the mentors who are actually getting insight as to some of the questions they're getting and realizing that just because some people have moved up in the company doesn't mean they have all the answers. And so we've done that with different groups as well. And then aside from the formal uncomfortable conversations, I'd say we focused on having some more real conversations. A couple years ago, we invited the Pride group to come in and they were going to make a pitch to the executive staff to add their, our pronouns behind our names and our Zoom sign in and on our email signatures and things like that. Well, we had a surprise. We had already all done it. And we actually presented back a slide to them that we'd finished it. But in the course of having that discussion, there was three representatives from the Pride group, and one of them had the pronouns they, them, next to their name. And somebody from our staff asked that person, why are your pronouns they, them? It was an innocent question. The, the person truly didn't know and they were trying to understand. That conversation is still burned in the brains of everybody who is in the room and on that Zoom call that day because the person who had the pronouns they, them ended up in tears. It was the first time they had ever publicly put those pronouns behind their name and they ended up explaining in as few words as possible what those pronouns meant. And that person's bravery had an impact on the entire leadership team and had a huge ability to educate all of us on what that meant. Seeing the Kleenexes here reminded me of this. I promise I won't need them. I can't tell you enough how much that person's bravery affected all of us, and that cascaded then through the rest of the organization. By the way, that person has since gone on to transition, and their pronouns are now she, her. They started as he, him. So I've proud of the support we provided, but it's things like that going all the way from talent acquisition to leadership development, as Matt was indicating, they're going to be critical to helping everybody in the organization. You know, I, I don't know that we're, we're perfect in this regard, but even in recent weeks as we've been trying to hire for positions, are we intentionally putting up roadblocks or barriers to who might respond to this because of the educational attainment that we say is necessary? Is that really necessary? Why is that necessary? Looking through the language of the physical demands that might be required on a job, and often it's just been copy-pasted, copy-pasted, copy-pasted uh, from one job description to another, and having the conversation, you know, what does it really mean to routinely and regularly lift 20 pounds or 40 pounds with four? or whatever, who is that putting up a barrier to that might be interested in this job? We haven't fixed that, corrected that, but you know, just in recent weeks we've been saying, I think we need to look at all the job descriptions and figure out what needs to come out and what needs to stay, because a lot of these things are required for some reasons. If we're not being intentional about why they're there in every situation or instance, um, I know that we're likely excluding people. So that's an example of what we are currently having conversations on, and hopefully in the very near future we'll be able to have an answer and an outcome based on action. What philosophical shifts or organizational changes have been required to do this work that you're talking about? So that's the first question. Second question is, is this work in your eyes or your organization's eyes a sprint or a marathon? So I think organizationally, one of the biggest philosophical shifts that we had to face both locally here in Rockford but across the 1,400 Habitat affiliates in the United States is that the system in place for housing is broken and that housing has not been a basic human right. Educating our board about fair housing, educating our committee members that help choose our home buyers, educating our entire staff and committee members about how housing has been systematically excluding people of color and especially low-income people of color. 
that the public housing system put in place was not for everyone. We read The Color of Law as part of our educational series that we started months ago when we began this DEI and B work. And so many of our staff had absolutely no idea how those systems got put into place and why the Fair Housing Act needed to come to fruition in the 60s. When you look at hot maps and heat maps of redlining in the Rockford area, and then you look at that exact same map overlaid with our current housing situation in terms of like how many people are renting, how many people are paying grossly over what 30% of their monthly income is, it's almost the exact same map. And so although those practices in theory happened decades ago, the effects of those policies and procedures are still in place today, specifically keeping groups of people from accessing affordable housing. Affordability is a continuum, right? Everybody in this room, hopefully, affords their living situation and affords their housing, but there's this idea that there is a group of people who are less deserving of it or that low-income housing equals affordable housing. So we had to do a lot of education. We had to teach a lot of lessons about what those systems did to affect our families today and why it's not easy for some people to just walk into a bank and apply for a mortgage. So philosophically, we had to recognize that we weren't just providing this amazing program for deserving families. We had to recognize and admit that we had been part of the problem and that we needed to, in the future, be part of the solution. The answer to the one word question, is this a marathon or is this a sprint? First of all, I think it might be an ultra marathon, although I've never run a mile in my life. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I think that this is you know, a significant process. We're at about mile three, maybe, in this ultra marathon. We are in our infancy as it relates to this philosophy in our organization, but we are committed to run the whole race. And then once we finish the race, we'll maybe hop on our bike and bike another thousand miles. This is a long process and we are committed to being a part of that. Philosophical change that I think we had to make was truly understanding that for visitors to belong, our residents needed to feel that they belong. And that for visitors to want to come here, residents should love living here. Uh, and, and then it amplifies out from there. And so when we do things like hosting Stroll on State, which is this year the 10th anniversary of an event that is free and open and welcoming to all, we take the mindset, and even in recent years, I think we're doing better of putting into practice, are we creating spaces within the event and experiences within the event for all people to truly feel that they belong at the event? And so while we started you know, now 10 years ago saying this is a free event that is open and you know, welcoming to all, I don't know that all 10 of those years or in the early years we were thinking through the lens of belonging and does everybody feel that they belong at this event? When we uh, started a couple of years ago with our creative project at Murals, which are meant to create beauty beauty and joy and, and create change or spark changes in neighborhoods, uh, we wanted to do so in ways that uh, were uplifting and, and lasting. And the intentionality that we've tried to bring to the artists that we've hired, both locally and visiting artists, and the works that they're producing, um, hopefully are sparking joy and helping people see themselves in their community. And I've heard stories of uh, people who didn't see themselves in their community and certainly not in, in expressions of public art. Um, it really knocked my socks off two summers ago when we had a, a, an event at uh, the mural that's on West State Street at Winnebago and the powerful impact that I didn't expect or see coming was when members of our deaf and hard of hearing community were expressing through sign language, which was then interpreted in, to the audience, this mural over here um, on social that says RKFD in American Sign Language. Even that act of creating a mural 
uh, which some people just see as, oh, that's cool. You know, that's a different way to say Rockford. To those members of our community felt that they were seen and heard and valued. To see the true joy on their face was really amazing. I had the experience this summer at the Coronado event that we hosted for A League of Their Own for the premiere of the series. And sitting in the theater that day, I saw something that I don't know that I ever saw before, which was that the peaches, which we love, were segregated. And that black members of our community and across the league through its 10 plus year existence, it was not welcoming, it was not inclusive. And so when we were actually in those days, in the final days of planning the mural on 7th Street to celebrate the Peaches, we had some conversations with the artists uh, to say, can you think about this a little differently? And they jumped right on. And so there are the representation of some of the more successful peaches. And in the background are two of the women who tried out for the All-American Girls League, but went on to play in the Negro Leagues because they were excluded from playing. And so they're kind of in the background. They're the hidden figures there. Once you see something, you can't unsee it. And I think in this work of trying to promote Rockford as a place where all belong and the mayor suggested that maybe we need to change the sign out at State Street and 990 to just say, you, you belong here, or all people belong here, uh, in addition to just being welcome. Going back to that philosophical shift, if we don't see people from a sense of belonging, that everybody belongs here, visitors won't feel that they belong here, residents won't feel they belong here. And I just think it's a great opportunity to, to do that work in this organization, have a greater sense of urgency to steward the responsibility to project in our community and beyond that this is a place where all people belong. And then to do the work that we all get to do to, to make that happen. So Mayor, I think it's a marathon. Five years ago, I completed the Chicago Marathon. I wouldn't say I ran it. And my analogy that I, as I thought about this question was, there were a lot of times in that marathon that I walked. And there were times that I sprinted. Eric ran the marathon too. He's a much better runner than me, much faster. And you know, there were times that I ran. And so in this work, I think sometimes we're running and sometimes we're sprinting and oftentimes we're walking and we wanna quit and we wanna give up, but we see how far we've come. And I mean, there was no way I wasn't finishing because like, how was I gonna walk off the course and tell my kids or my wife that were cheering me on, I can't finish. So that's when I walked. And so when you're tired, you walk. And when you're tired, you stop and you get your water and then you keep on going and then you pick up the pace and then you run and then you sprint and then you sprint across the finish line. Well, it hasn't happened to me yet. I do know that many, many, many marathoners, once they finish that exhausting race, sign up again and again and again. And so uh, I haven't finished uh, my second marathon yet, but I guess I'll have to work on that. <laughs> so Mayor, I think it's a marathon. As we think about the philosophical shifts that maybe we need to, that are required to do this work, our organizations, I would say, a lot of them are old. You know, they all have their own, their own history, right? And in history, I think I mentioned a little bit about this, you know, sometimes as leaders we need to reflect and understand how our history has defined us, how it has shaped us, and also how it has reinforced us, right? And history reinforces us in positive and negative ways, and being aware of how the old way of doing things that we had talked about a little bit Sometimes there is a new way, sometimes there's a better way, sometimes there's not a better way. And just continuing to create checks and balances to be, to be willing to have that conversation that the old way of doing things, although it is one way, is not the only way to do things. It's a kind of a give and a take that, that we kind of focus on. I think that it's not something that we have to move quickly and, and make this mad dash to, to automatically change everything, but I think it could be created as more of a conversation and to create that conversation where you do invite everyone to the table. You invite those that are impacted to the table so they can help you create the appropriate solution for your organization and for the community. As you think about it, I wanna leave you with a question to think about what are you willing to give up from your organization for a positive change, right? That's a hard question to answer, but as organizations transform, they have to give something up in order to grow right? Sometimes in life, there's a little bit of developmental heat, right? And that heat is painful. It's tough, right? But we have to be able to willing to give something up in order to have that positive change. A perfect example is if you, everyone, everyone knows Best Buy and everyone knows Circuit City, which one's still around? Best Buy. Best Buy made a very tough decision to 
emphasize omni-channel sales, where Circuit City focused more on internal sales, like in the store. One of them was very successful, the other one wasn't. DNI is going to be a very different, different type of conversation, but being willing to understand what are those positive changes that we need to make that will help us write our next chapter to become our best chapter. Is it a marathon or a sprint? I would say it's both. I had a conversation yesterday with a colleague where sometimes it is a sprint. You know, sometimes if there's discrimination, if there's an issue that you need to solve, you need to solve that like yesterday. And that's a sprint. You need to run. You need to put that fire out. You need to make sure that someone feels whole, someone feels safe. At times, when it comes to policy change, organizational transformation, those types of things, that is really a marathon. And sometimes it's a quick marathon. Sometimes you're going you're gonna to stop. Sometimes you're going to scratch your head. Sometimes you're going to need to take that break and get some water. And then other times, you're just going to need to have that mad dash to the finish line. And then just so you know, once you get to the finish line, which probably is always going to be moving, there's always going to be something else that you'll have to find a way to create equitable opportunities for people. So yes, this is perpetual work. As my boss always says, it is job security if you are in this, in this field. And I think that, again, it could be both. Some of the philosophical differences or changes. The first I'd say is growing the pie. So think in terms of a pie chart. And you look at that and how it breaks down demographics. And as recently as a month ago, we just had this debate with another group of individuals, which is, okay, so if we're saying that we are going to promote more black people, then that means less white people get promoted and I'm going to be disadvantaged. Okay, well, let us first assume our company is never going to grow. We're never going to do better. We're never going to have more opportunities. And so that's one of the philosophical changes we've had to get a, impress upon people is, we are going to continue to grow and do better. There's going to be opportunities for everybody, and there's not a scarcity model where if one person wins, somebody else has to lose. That's not what this is all about. The second one is around personal storytelling and vulnerability. If you don't make it personal and you don't put yourself out there, people are going to have a hard time relating to you. And so, like the story I told about the young person who put their pronouns out there and told their story, that was extremely impactful. And I think that was a lesson to all of us is we have to figure out what stories do we have and how do we put ourselves out there personally so that we can really relate to the people of the organization and make a difference for them. The last one I'd mention is shifting the ownership. So being the face of a movement can be extremely tiring. But what I've grown to learn is that being the face of a movement is even more tiring when you're part of the movement. And so here's what we did right after the George Floyd incident. We took the two black people that were on staff and asked them to lead a lot of discussions and help organize a lot of activities. Without thinking about the fact, they were already dealing with their own issues and their own feelings and their own grief during that period of time. We turned to them because we felt like they understood better than we did, and they did. But the reality was they already had enough on their plate. And so what that means is the rest of us have to get better educated. Go to the Simmons Women's Leadership Conference. Go to the Out and Equal Summit. Attend a National Society of Black Engineers Conference. Learn what people are dealing with and learn what they're struggling with so you can be part of that, you can be a face of that, and help take some of that burden off their shoulders in order to help progress what they need so that that group feels like they belong as much as everyone else. And so with that, it's going to be a journey, and I don't think it's ever going to end. Matt, Matthew made that point right at the end where even if you hit the finish line, there's going to be another one in front of you. And so I think it's going to be a journey that we're just going to be on perpetually as we continue to improve generation after generation.